I'm so excited to have you all here. I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves and give a little brief history on the business before we dive into the questions. Molly, why don't you kick us off and give everyone an introduction? Oh, I think you're on mute. Let's just get you. There you oh, go. How about that? <laughs> Thanks for that. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks, Emily. My name is Molly Bowlers, and I'm the owner and founder of Life Stage Massage in Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, we're a therapeutic massage practice, um, emphasizing safe, nurturing, client-centered care for uh, individuals at all stages of life with a special focus on prenatal care. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Shane, I'm going to kick it over to you. I was excited to see how it looked in the gym, so I'm glad you did this setup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, happy to be on here. My name is Shane Langwell. Uh, I'm the owner, founder of Nomad Krav Maga in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, we've been doing that since 2016 there, but before that, I was also um, instructing at different schools um, for more than a decade. So I'm, I'm happy to be on here. Um, what we do is we, you know, we help people from all walks of life, uh, soccer moms, soccer dads, law enforcement, military, no experience, professionals, whatever level of experience they come in looking to learn to defend themselves, empower themselves, gain confidence, improve their skills to walk their daily life and just feel safer, more secure for themselves and their families. So um, that's the skill, uh, that's the, uh, you know, service we offer. Um, also a great fitness component alongside that as well, just getting people healthier um, so that they can tackle their daily life with more tenacity and more enjoyment. So I love doing it and we're happy to help people, uh, not only in the Las Vegas community, um, but we actually have our curriculum and uh, affiliates out in the nation. They're not actually our location, but they're, uh, you know, using our, our curriculum and skills to help do the same thing for their communities for them. So it's awesome. Amazing. Thank you so much. Dan, over to you. Hey, I'm Dan Moranville. I've been the CEO of Chicago Pet Sitter since 2022, and I joined the team in 2018 actually as a dog walker. I was not planning on doing this kind of work long term. Um, I, was, I had just finished graduate school and was looking for a position in my field of youth development, but I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, what could be better than showing up to work every day, getting fresh air, exercise, and giving belly rubs to 10 of your best friends. Um, when I had the opportunity to help run the company, I uh, really wanted to look for opportunities to continue to make this a job that people could stay in for years and years. Um, our company was started in 2005 when our founder, Dana DeGrini, started with a single dog walk. I think she's in the audience, so shout out, Dana. Um, and from the beginning, our focus has been creating a positive work environment, dignifying, supportive place to work. And I've seen that focus result in very low uh, staff turnover, incredibly high level of service. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be here and share our experience. Thank you so much for joining us. And, you know, one of the other big themes between all of your experiences is this passion and connection to the offerings that you provide. And it comes through so much when you share about what you all do. So I really appre appreciate that. And I think a lot of people can also identify with that. You know, these businesses were born out of a need and something that you wanted to address in your market. Molly, I'm going to bring my first question to you. Can you talk about that hole in your own experience with massage that really caused you to start Life Stages and also how you've taken it upon yourself to educate your team and your customers so that they're more aware of the benefits of massage. Sure, Emily, thanks. So my journey started out with myself being a client of massage therapy. Um, I had my first massage at a spa in Manhattan and I absolutely loved the experience. Um, and since then I have tried out a lot of different massages and I always felt like there was something something that was missing. Um, the therapists kind of would, they would pass over things that I felt that needed attention. And it didn't seem like they really knew how to locate and act effectively treat those discomforts that I knew intuitively that massage could alleviate. 
Um, and it was it was just such a strange experience because it to me it was like, well, isn't that what massage is for? Of course, it's very relaxing as well. And that's what you find the most of. Uh, either that or you find people attempting to do therapeutic work, but just beating people up. And that's no fun either. It's not helpful or effective. Um, it you know, just makes things worse. So I set out to figure out how this can actually be done. And I utilized every single session that I personally performed over the last 20 years <laughs> to figure it out, uh, just working really closely with clients, exploring, asking for feedback, adjusting, until finally I was able to really see with my hands and I knew how to utilize my body structure and mechanics um, and my sensory perception uh, to accurately locate, isolate, and treat and alleviate people's specific discomforts comfortably, safely, and effectively um, in a way that um, would, would last and they would experience lasting results and just have a, a, a better quality of life as a result. You know, when you're in pain, you can't pay attention to your uh, your work, your relationships. Pain just takes up all of your attention and drains your energy. So we see this as a way of liberating that energy that's bound up in pain and tension and making it available for people to apply towards their life purpose and their meaningful relationships. And I love how that education also allows you to deepen the connection with the client too. You know, it teaches them, it allows them to open up with what they're hoping to get out of it. So it's really a great thing that you've done and kind of brought communication into an industry where it hasn't always been such a big part of it. Shane, I'm going to come to you next. You guys teach obviously about self-defense and also these methods of Krav Maga but you also create community and it's really about coming to class and knowing some of the other people that are participating. Can you talk about how you curate that community and create connection with your customers? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, whenever people are coming in to learn self-defense with us, there's a lot of different motivations for them, whether they want to learn to protect their family, get in shape, um, or maybe they've been unfortunately assaulted uh, in the past. And, you know, they, they come together in this community of people who have felt those same feelings that they've felt that led them to the same place. So they're already generally in a, in a like-minded community. Um, and then what they do is they see each other daily or weekly, you know, pushing their own boundaries mentally and physically to grow stronger, more capable and more confident. So uh, through the hardship that, you know, we're safely putting them through uh, simulated hardship. And, you know, it is actually hard. It's not simulated, but they're able to grow closer together. So um, just like, you know, elite military teams and things as they go through their hard selection period, they come out of those things, you know, bonded as brothers and sisters. So that's kind of the same feeling that a lot of our members get in our classes. Um, so as far as community wise, um, definitely having events for them to socialize, you know, outside of classes is, is a great thing for them. Um, we're actually doing that more and more now uh, in the future, just as we're growing, um, making sure that we target more of that outside class member experience. So we've actually hired on new people to um, be able to do that even more for them, um, making sure they're coming to classes, keeping them accountable, helping them out through any obstacles they have, and then setting up events like bowling, laser tag. We went horseback riding before um, out in the you know deserts, uh, Red Rock Canyon area of Las Vegas is really beautiful. So we do things like that. Uh, we're definitely ramping that up uh, throughout 2024 with our new growth uh, that we're that we're putting in. And the growth is really targeted towards member experience and just providing uh, even outside of our world class training, even targeting more of a world class, you know, total experience for the members. So that's where we're focused on now um, to move forward. And, you know, I definitely think it's an amazing opportunity for for everybody involved with Nomad Krav Maga, um, especially the students to, to learn and grow and just meet people and have fun. I love that. And I remember in our prep call, it was exciting to hear you talk about like growing, not necessarily meaning more teachers and more classes, but actually deepening the relationship with some of the clients you already have and getting those new employees to focus on things like curating new clients and not just teaching classes. So that's right. a big shift for you. And I think that's important for other businesses. You know, 
hiring, it might be for a totally different job you've never even thought of. As your business grows and evolves, you might need to hire in different areas. And your team was telling you and your customers were telling you they wanted more attention and community time. And it's awesome that you're able to pivot and, and give them that. That's so cool. Thank you. Okay, Dan, we're going to bring it to you. We were joking in our prep call that your clients are kind of two different clients, right? You have your actual pets that you're taking care of and then your paying clients, your owners of these pets, but you're creating connection and community kind of digitally and remotely. You know, it's not this same traditional experience where a customer comes in and works with an employee at Chicago Pet Sitters. Can you talk about how you do create that connection to the clients and build community, even though it's much different than in Shane's classes? Yeah, since the since the pandemic, um, obviously a lot more people work from home. And so uh, there is some person to person interaction a little bit more now where somebody's you know working at their home office, uh, dog walker comes in. But for the most part, our staff um, will never meet the, the people who are actually paying the invoice. It'd be funny if the cats and dogs actually had their little money and, and would pay us at the end of the visit. But um, they, uh, we create community in, in you know, different ways where I think one of the best parts, and this is, this is uh, foundational in our training even, um, the best part that we always hear from our clients is the pictures you get every day. And I've been on that side too. When I've gone out of town, my cats um, get taken care of and getting the little pictures of my cat, you know, it's just like, Oh, you know, so cute seeing them playing and, um, and snuggling on the couch and whatever and begging for food. Um, so it's fun. And, and there's a chat feature in our, in the app that we use. So there's kind of a communication that uh, a little conversation that can get started um, and, you know, our staff have bios in the app as well. And so there's a little bit of, you kind of get to know each other a little bit. Um, and it's all focused on our mutual love for the pet. I love that. I have my dogs always with their dog sitters and that's the best part when they send me little updates and let me know what's going on with them. And, you know, I think the takeaway for a lot of businesses there is, Technology. I mean, you all leverage a platform that allows you to create those connections. Sometimes in your brick and mortar business, maybe you have a way to tell the customer's name. You know, if you have classes and you're checking them in, or it's a repeat customer putting in their little rewards number, those types of technology platforms allow you to sometimes create connection through them. So think of that. If you're maybe not a high touch business, what are some ways you can connect or follow up with your customers? And maybe it's technology that's going to help you do that. Okay. We're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about overcoming challenges. You all have had, you know, businesses that have been around for a while. So the business life has kind of ebbed and flowed and had many ups and downs. Molly, why don't you start and share one of your entrepreneurial challenges and what you learned along the way? Sure, Emily. Uh, so I think one of the biggest challenges that I've struggled with over the course of being an entrepreneur in this field is um, having that right balance between um, compassion and understanding for circumstances, uh, but also um, standing firm in your policies. And particularly this shows up for us in our cancellation policy. Um, you know, we, we're in a tough spot because our, our clients really see us as caring, nurturing providers, which we are, uh, but that also lends to a sense of entitlement with regards to making exceptions on short notice cancellations. And there's really, um, there's really an imbalance between the sense of what that time means to the client versus what it means to us. Um, it costs us money. Uh, you know, that session would have contributed to the overhead of the business. Um, we still have to pay our um, administrative staff and we still pay our service provider for that appointment if the cancellation occurs in under 24 hours. And that's part of the reason why we're able to retain our staff for many, many years, much longer than the average uh, spa. Uh, because we do respect our therapist's time. And that allows us to develop them 
and their skills to the level of quality that our clients enjoy. So for, for the clients to make the connection between the level of expertise and the experience that they have with us um, and how that's directly linked to their commitment to honor our time, uh, it's hard sometimes to communicate that in a way that um, clients understand. More and more of our clients are accepting and respecting and honoring uh, that for us, but we still have the occasional client who's very indignant about it, especially if they feel that they, you know, um, couldn't have foreseen it or there was a real emergency. And we're very clear about that upon booking. You know, we state very clearly, it's taken us many, many iterations of the language so that we know we're covering all of our bases at the point of booking the appointment. Uh, we tell them, uh, you know, no exceptions. Even, you know, even for reschedules and medical emergencies, circumstances outside of your control, this is, you know, this is what it is. And they agree to it, but they still feel entitled to an exception when it comes down to it, such to the point of even writing negative reviews about that. And we have a 4.9 star rating on Yelp with over 200 reviews, which is pretty high from what I see. Um, and in Google as well, we have a, a higher than average number of reviews. Um, again, 4.9 stars and that one, that 0 0.1 star, that's all the cancellation policy. But I have to tell you something. I've had calls from clients who have said that they saw those reviews and that they respect our time and therapists who are applying for jobs to come work for me have said, you know what? I really appreciate that you stand firm in your policy because I know that I'm going to be respected. And they've had a lot of experiences at other places where the management has said to them, oh, sorry, you know, and what are they going to do? It, 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 it hurts. It doesn't feel good at all. And how do you expect someone to genuinely care for a client over and over and over again to keep that purity and that genuine sincerity of care if they're if they're not being respected and valued you just can't have your cake and eat it too you know and it's hard to put your foot down but you have to do it but i totally agree and i'm so glad that you shared this because i think it's a big thing that a lot of businesses struggle with and it's important to set a situation up like yours is a 24-hour policy to communicate it and then to stand by it and you know there might be these times that you decide to do a one-off or whatever the situation is but I think standing by it and standing firm is so important because like you said for all of the various reasons but the main one in my mind is to teach the consumer and if they don't like that policy and they don't understand why it's there, then in the long run, that's not a good client that you want to maintain either. And, you know, I'll just give a quick example because I was doing a completely different industry yesterday in a coaching session, but it was the same thing. It was an attorney. Their client hadn't gotten them everything they needed to draw up the contract by the deadline they originally wanted it by. And so when they gave everything, the attorney said, you know, I'll get you it in five days. That's the policy. And they said, well, no, we need it in two. And the attorney didn't know what to do. They thought they could shuffle all this other stuff around and get it done. I said, tell them it'll be X amount of dollars if they want it in two days. You know, see if they want it that bad. Or if they want to abide by your policy, which is five days. And the next time, they'll be sure to get that information to you five days before they want the contract. And what do you know? They decided they can wait until the five-day due date. And, you know, this business owner, maybe in this case, can get it done and give it to them early. But I think by having this policy, and now it's a new thing. It's just her new option. You want it by this different date? Here's the amount based on her availability. And sticking to that is respecting your time, your employee's time, and it teaches over time how to behave. And it's really important, but it's hard in the moment to do it. And when you get the negative review, it feels like, oh, but if you take the time to respond to that review publicly, not even getting into the back and forth, but just reinforcing the policy in a respectful way, other consumers will see that and they will not steer away from you because of that critical review. You know, they'll come to you and maybe even have more respect for the policy before their first visit. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. Shane, I'm going to bring it to you. 
on the prep call, we were talking about how some of your most stressful times have been in these growth stages, like the exciting time when you're going to the next level, it can be the hardest. Can mm-hmm. you share advice you have for people going through those growth stages and maybe how you navigated them? Yeah, of course. So we're, we're in a growth stage right now, as we were talking about in the prep call. Um, I've actually been interviewing multiple people for new positions in the in the gym as of as of like literally today. So the main thing with the growth phase is to keep your, you know, your your out, stay outcome focused. What are you trying to accomplish? And then set standards for what you're looking for. Um, and then clearly communicate those standards to potential, you know, candidates for the job or new hires, things like this to know they'll, they'll know what they're being measured for to see if they're doing a good job. Um, and it's not just left up in the air, like, you know, specifically having, uh, you know, a key performance indicator for each job um, and a good communication cadence set up, meaning um, how often are you reviewing these things with that person and what are they being measured by? So um, the fact that they, they're not, you know, ambiguous and there's no ambiguity to that, they're going to feel more confident in their role. They're going to want to do a better job for you. Um, and if they're not doing a great job, you can give them specific action points on how to improve because you actually have a specific metric that they're being measured by. So, you know, just being clear in expectations and standards, that's going to be a thing um, that, you know, I highly recommend um, as far as finding the right people for the job. Don't be in too much of a hurry. You know, don't just hire your brother's friend because you, you like your brother, you know, um, and they tell you they're going to do a good job. Make sure you're actually doing your due diligence to post out the job, get multiple applications. If you need to get more applications on whatever, you know, um, whatever job posting forum or, you know, app or whatever it is, whatever one you're using, if you need a more higher influx of job applications quicker, don't be afraid to put a few dollars towards it every day, uh, like to advertise that job. Um, Because if people don't know about your job, they're not gonna apply for your job. Um, So, you know, that's my key advice to help you grow um, just stick to your standards, know what your standards are and communicate those standards from the very beginning. I even do it directly in the interview process. If I've got somebody that's, you know, really looking good as a prospect, I might move them to the next stage, which was, you know, first I was talking about them and their experience and, you know, my company with Nomad Krav Maga and how, you know, maybe we can merge together for the goals. But now that they're in the next level of interview, go ahead and share what they're going to be measured by, what they're expected to do with them from the very beginning and say, does that sound good to you? Um, Because if, if you hire them and they don't know what they're going to be measured by, then they start and you're, and they don't like it. And then you're like, Oh, I'm in back to square one because this person doesn't like the job now that they really know what the job is. So I literally pull up a screen share um, and I'll show them exactly what their daily schedule looks like, what their metrics are. Um, before they even start as just part of the interview process. And then I'm like, does that look like a good job to you that you would like to do? And then they're like, yes or no. And that, that helps us start on the, you know, the, the, the proper foot right away. That's such good advice. And all three of you were sharing how important putting together like processes and things like that. And even relating to the stage of when it's like a solopreneur or a small thing, that's the hardest time to put the processes together because it's, you know, you doing it, but you do need to even at that stage so that when you bring on that first employee or you need someone to help, even in a short term area, you have it written down. It doesn't just live in your head how you do things and how you navigate. And Dan, I'm going to actually bring it to you because you did a fun little project last January kind of getting into the weeds of the business. Can you walk everyone through that exercise you did and kind of what the benefits and outcome were? Yeah, I'm always doing a fun little project for sure. Um, so I uh, I actually took my, my kitchen table, three by five cards and a Sharpie. And I wrote down on each card um, what every single thing that we do, every single thing, invoicing, scheduling, hiring, training, every piece of it. Um, and so that took a lot of time to kind of think through, you know, there were, there were a few things where it was like, okay, let me go look in our, you know, main email. Oh, 
I remember one more thing. Uh, let me go look in this thing. Oh, I remember one more thing and kept writing down until I just had everything out um, and sort of just started mixing things up. Um, and what I found was one, there was a lot of stuff that I could cut out. Um, you know, you mentioned that we've all been in business for, for quite a long time. You, you accrue a lot of tasks over 20 years of business that you don't necessarily need. They're not serving your business. They're not serving your clients or your staff. And those things got to go. Um, and, and so one of the things that I was really trying to do was create a more efficient operation, create a more, um, a less ambiguous operation where we kind of broke down silos between our uh, management roles. And so everybody kind of knew um, what was going on. And what I did was I took each of those little responsibilities, each three by five card, and I made it my job to create a guide, a step-by-step -step guide of how to do each one of these things. Obviously there's some responsibilities that can't be just put into a, a bullet, you know, list of, of check marks, but um, as, as clearly as I could communicate it on a piece of virtual paper, um, I have that in our main Google drive and all of the managers can access that. And so I've been actually onboarding a new manager this week. Um, somebody who's been a pet sitter with us since 2021. And so I've been walking them through, Hey, Here's the guide. If you can't, if you ever have a question about anything, just type it in the search in the drive and something will come up. Um, and, you know, you can't get a hold of me or I haven't gone over this with you already. Um, then something's going to come up and it's, it's probably going to be pretty easy to follow straight through and you'll be able to get it, uh, get this thing done that you need to do. So, yeah. I, and, and one of sort of the goals in that whole process was just to remove remove all of the fluff, um, all of the extra stuff that we're doing, create a more simple operation um, and to remove any sort of anxiety out of the job. We've tried to do that with our uh, pet sitting staff, the people who are in the field every day, creating, like Shane was saying, creating very clear expectations. Here's exactly what you're expected to do. No more, no less. Um, and, uh, and do it with your own spin on it, of course, but bring your personality, of course. Um, and then also with our management team, here's what the expectations are. Um, here's what you're expected to review and evaluate day to day. Um, and so all of that ambiguity reduces anxiety and lets everybody feel a little, you know, take a deep breath. And it creates more this sort of positive feedback flow um, in our whole operation day to day. Absolutely. I'm going to stay with you, Dan, for a second here and kind of piggyback off that. Um, employees is obviously a huge challenge for people, whether it's hiring, getting the right employees, what those employees do once you train them and how they represent and reflect the business. For your team, it's even more like challenging because you're not seeing these employees. You're not watching them interact with customers or do their job. So I just love from that perspective, advice, whether you want to kind of dig into how you hire, how you maybe train, or even just keep them engaged as staff members as they continue with you. Yeah, um, I was looking at some of the notes, uh, you know, the little, little behind the curtain kind of thing. We have notes that were, you know, from our prep call. But um, yeah, so I was looking through that and I thought, nowhere in here is pay. Pay is huge. I mean, that's, we, we, we boosted our, and Molly, what you were saying about the late cancellation stuff and all that resonated totally. Um, we have the same policy. We pay our staff if uh, a client cancels late and they've already started their day, you still get paid for that. You were planning on it. You arranged your day around it. Um, so creating policies that really make a lot of sense for the way that it works um, so one of the things that we built into our pay structure now is a lot of our staff are using their own personal car, their own personal bike, or the Chicago Transit Authority uh, to get around. And those things all cost money. Gas is expensive. You know, you gotta you gotta build those leg muscles to power your bike and eat a granola bar while you're going or whatever. Um, and it costs money for a CTA pass. And so 
we built into our pay model, not only are you getting paid for the time that you're at the visit, you're also getting paid for uh, the travel. So there's a base travel fee for every visit. Staff have loved that. Um, and then once you kind of have pay figured out, you're creating other um, situations, the support, the, the thing that I always get feedback from um, staff when I do one-on-ones with them is the support from the management team is essential. It feels like so good to always have somebody just right at my fingertips, my thumb tips, you know, ready to answer a message. If I have some sort of issue, um, Hey, this dog is growling at me. What do I do? You know, um, has this happened to sitters before? Um, and walking through that, um, uh, and so that, that support always being there, that, that lifeline always being there. Um, but then we've set all those things up. Now it kind of goes back to your question about hiring and, and what are we looking for? I always ask, my first question in every interview is, why does this make sense for you? What about your life right now? Why are you seeking this job? Because if this is sort of just a throwaway, whatever, go, go start an account on WAG or Rover. I don't need you here. Um, if you love animals, you love cats, you love dogs, um, you uh, are, are looking for something that makes sense to fit with your creative career, career makes sense to fit with a full-time job and you're trying to save extra money, you know, to buy a house or something like that. This really makes sense for you. Um, and you're really, truly a pet person, then you're one of us. Um, and so uh, this is not sort of side gig for side gig sake. This is side gig maybe, or full-time gig for people who love pets, um, pet people. And so um, one of the other one of the other things beyond that is once they're hired, the biggest challenge for us is creating and starting off a relationship of trust because it's a service industry job, and I recognize that it's a service industry. And I'm, whoever else has worked a service industry job knows, typically not the best managers, not the most respect from um, managers in those situations. And so creating a situation where they know they're respected, they're trusted, and that we are trustworthy, um, that they can talk to us like we're normal human beings, they can call in sick if they're sick, they can have a mental health day if they need a mental health day. Um, you know, I, I always say like, I'm not your therapist, so, you know, I'm not going to like walk through and, you know, like you can go and find a therapist and do that. That's great. Um, but bring your full self. If you're having a tough time, let me know about it. That's okay. You can let me know. I'm going to respect that information, respect where you're at in your life right now. It's not going to affect your job, but knowing that lets me work with you and find a setup for you that helps you, um, stay here, enjoy the, the, you know, the free therapy from the dogs and the cats, um, and then, uh, and, and creates trust and creates a, an environment where they they feel comfortable communicating with us. Um, but we have to also do that with them and communicate very clearly and, and upfront and be transparent and everything with them too. For sure. I think that's great yeah. advice. Molly, your employees are certified in their trade. You know, they, in many rights are like their own provider, but they work under your brand, your name, your life stage massage way, you know, this approach that you have. Can you talk about how you provide that training and create culture within your team without maybe taking away their individuality? For sure. For sure. Absolutely. Um, so yes, um, it's true that massage therapy is a licensed profession in the state of New Jersey, most states now. Uh, so in order to become a massage therapist, uh, there's quite a bit of schooling that these individuals have to undergo. They work very hard to attain that designation. Uh, and when they come to work for me, um, you know, they have a pretty good base. But having been a massage therapy instructor myself for many years at several schools, I'm quite familiar with the curriculum and how it's delivered. And there's quite a few additions that if I had my way, I would um, make and some exclusions. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, 
So I do have my own onboarding training. It's very extensive that all my therapists uh, participate in. Um, and then uh, beyond that, I do ongoing professional development sessions, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, small groups um, on, a, on a periodic ongoing basis to um, continue to develop their skills and also just to steep them in our culture and philosophy. That's a, a really big part of it because there's a lot of ideas out there that I disagree with and I think are foundational to our success. For example, there's a, there's a no pain, no gain idea that's very popular in massage and I couldn't disagree with it more. Um, I really feel that that's a cover up for sloppy work um, to be honest. Uh, and I think that the biggest problem in massage, as in, as, as you'll probably agree with me in many industries is people's egos. So people feel the need to see themselves as a certain level of competence or see themselves as more perfect than maybe anybody could possibly be uh, hold themselves or expect others to hold themselves to expectations that just aren't possible um and then pretend that they are these images of themselves um, and it's totally alienating um it's so dishonest and it prevents them from being able to actually learn and grow i mean um you know I, somebody once i don't know if bruce lee said this but uh cup too full you know <laughs> yeah you have to, you know, if your cup is too full, that mean, doesn't mean you know everything. It means your cup is too small. You need a bigger cup. So I love that. I love that. So, That's amazing. <laughs> so we make it, we make it okay to not know everything and to be in a growth mindset. Um, we normalize and validate that, hey, there's enough to know here to occupy the grandest grandmasters, multiple lifetimes of study to get to where this could go. So don't feel like you need to know everything. Like let's, you know, come at this with a blank slate and say, what makes sense? What works? Because that's why they call it a practice, you know? <laughs> it's, it's Gotta do it over time to get better. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, Shane, I'm gonna give you the very fun challenge of closing us out. We are yep. actually at time, so you better pick the best piece of advice you can possibly think of to close us out. What's it going to be? Awesome. That's a, a, a big thing to have uh, responsibility-wise, but I'm going to give it to the audience more so about you know self-defense training rather than necessarily business-wise. If you're not training in self-defense and putting your health first, you definitely need to, you know, think about your priorities. A lot of times people have different excuses. Um, they're out of time. They don't have time. They don't have money. They don't have, um, you know, they're too far away. These kind of excuses, they're just that. They're excuses um, because we all have the same 24 hours in every day. Um, as far as money goes, you know, you could always just look at your priorities, where you're spending your money. There's definitely going to be somewhere else you could, you know, designate those funds to. And, you know, self-defense training is going to be amazing because not only does it benefit you know, if you're ever attacked, you, you want to be able to defend yourself and your family. But even if you don't have to use those skills, the, you know, physically, your confidence is going to shoot up, it's going to bleed over into other areas of your life. Um, you're going to be more successful in work, you're going to be a better husband, a better wife, all these things are going to grow because you're putting yourself under, you know, physical challenges, mental challenges, and becoming better every day, even if it's just one time a week. Um, you know, it's something that's going to pay dividends because if you're going to invest in something, it might as well be in your health, might as well be in yourself and in your confidence, um, because that's one investment that's always going to pay maximum dividends is improving yourself. And self-defense is a worthwhile thing to get into. Um, if, if you're looking for a place, just find somebody that works for you in your neighborhood and is going to work. You know, you can actually show up. Um, also, check us out on YouTube. Nomad Krav Maga. Might as well put out the plug in there, right? So uh, we're I love it. I let you take the last mic, so I'll allow it. We yeah, also yeah. have Chicago <laughs> Pet Sitters and Life Stage yep. Massage. If you want to check them out as well, you guys, thank you so much. A huge round of applause. That was so much helpful and useful information for people at any stage in their business. I know you're all so busy, and I really appreciate you hopping on with us. 
I'm going to launch the poll for this session. So everyone, please answer those two questions. Let us know what you thought. And to Dan, Molly, and Shane, thank you again. I hope you have a good rest of your afternoon. We are so grateful for your expertise.